Adam for coming here. Um, thank Adam and the rest of the Boise State staff for putting this on. Um, I'm going to talk to you today ab about our culture. And a couple of things you should know. Um, fair warning, this is a ridiculously long presentation. Uh, I tried to make it shorter, but I couldn't. Um, I think there's too many things uh, that are going to make us successful. There's too many things um, to the point where I felt like if I didn't share this stuff with you, I'd be sliding you. That being said, anytime um, this weekend, if you have questions, you want to know what we do or how we do it or why we do it, I'm an open book. I'm very transparent in what I do, how I do it, with everyone. So feel free to ask me, feel free to talk to me about what we do and why we do it. Um, also, I'll warn you, I've got a dry sense of humor. Um, there aren't a lot of jokes in this. Uh, if you don't get my jokes, look to the person on the left, look to the person on the right, you're not alone. Other people don't get it too. It takes a little while to figure me out, okay? Next thing, I felt really, really good about myself because I was given access to the Bison font. We have our very own font that we use for all of our communication. That's not it. Adam does not have access to it. I, I finally got to the point uh, at North Dakota State history where I'm, I'm trusted to have this font and I can get to use it in my communication. You don't get to see it up there, um, but uh, I felt really good about myself. So the, our title, you can't really see it, but it's the Bison Way Cultivating Culture of Champions. And I'm going to talk to you about, about our culture as best I can in every possible way. Um, I'm going to talk to you about myself kind of, because I think you need to know a little bit about me, because everything that I do and who I am is interwoven in our culture and our strength program, and how I work with our athletes, how I work with our staff. So it's a big part of it. I want to lay that foundation. I want to make sure you know it. It's not about me. What we're doing was good long before I was there, and it'll be good long after I'm there. But it's important you understand who I am, what I'm about, uh, so we can get into it. I'll give you some background on the university. Some of you know about North Dakota State, some of you competed against us, some of you have been there, some of you have no idea who we are and what we're about. I need to share that with you. You need to know how important it is to me, you need to know what we're all about. And then what I'm going to get into talking about in depth is how we build our culture within our strength and conditioning program uh, as we've built something I think I'm really proud of and I feel is really special. So, as Adam said, um, I, I'm in my 11th year at North Dakota State University. Um, in that time, we've gone from uh, transitioning Division II school, we transitioned to Division I. Uh, we made probably the most successful transi transition that's ever been made, and probably the most successful transition that ever will be made. Um, during that time, um, we've won conference championships, we've, won, we've beat high majors, we have won games in NCAA tournaments, and we've won national championships. Um, throughout that, um, our strength program, right or wrong, has been given a lot of credit for it. Um, our athletes are ones that need to develop. Our coaches believe that we're, we're a big part of it. Our administration believes that we're a big part of it. Because of that, we've been able to gain a tremendous amount of support. Um, we have been able to build a culture uh, or a program where we've gone from four strength coaches and now we have eight. We have a director for football, we have a director for Olympic sports. And all that's come about because of the success and the hard work of our athletes. Um, I, I truly believe uh, we have a championship culture. We have a championship standard and we have a championship culture at North Dakota State. So, big part about North Dakota State, I think, that makes us successful is just our values. The things that we value, the things that I think things that are important to us. And these aren't just things that I think are important. I, I talked to some of our coaches about this. I said, hey, these are, these are what I think are our values. And every single one of our coaches agreed with me. Um, and, and this stuff runs true through interwoven through every single team. And it's about the greater university as a whole. First thing, North Dakota State, we value competing and we value winning, without a doubt. Um, we don't just hope to win. We don't just expect to have a good game. We expect to go in and we expect to compete and we expect to win against every single team that we play. In every situation, in every environment. We prepare that way, um, we're detailed, we get after in our training, we practice that way, we got a sign on the wall that says bring on the competition and that's how we do things. At the highest level we possibly can and we expect to be successful. We believe we do things the right way. Everything we do at NDSU, I've never been in a situation or a place or school where we come to a crossroads, we, we're not really sure what we want to do, whether it's with an athlete, a business decision, a budget decision, facilities, recruiting, whatever it is, and it always comes down to it, and always comes down to this. We always look each other in the eye and say, this is the right way to do it. 
this is the right way. And everybody knows it. Everyone shares that integrity. Everyone shares that value across the board at the university. The team is more important than the individual. It is, it is uh, not an I, me, and my culture. It is very much an us and we. Okay? The strength of the herd is in the bison, and the strength of the bison is in the herd. Okay? That stuff resonates through everything we do. None of our athletes have their name on the back of their jersey. Not a single one has their name on the back of their jersey. The name on the front is the one that matters. The name on the front is the one that they play for. Every year our athletes are asked if they want their names on their jersey. Every year they say no. That's pretty meaningful, that's pretty powerful. And I think it says a lot about the type of kids that we have. Next part, the Bison family. We truly have a family atmosphere. We truly have a family within our university. Not within, just within our athletic department, but within the university as a whole. Everyone at NDSU wants NDSU to be successful. When you play, when you compete, you might be playing for your conference championship, you might be playing for your national championship, for your team, but ultimately when you compete, when you step on the field, you're competing for us. You're competing for NDSU. And that resonates across everything we do. Each team wants to be successful. Each team wants to win. Each team wants to be the best that they can be. They want to do it not just for them, but for our athletic department and the university as a whole. It's something that, you know, all of our athletes support each other. They go to each other's games. They challenge each other. Uh, they want each other to win. They truly want each other to be successful. So, when I was putting this presentation together, I really wasn't sure where to start. I really didn't know where I wanted to go with it because I think it is really broad. And, and so what I did is I reached out to some former staff members and, and honestly a lot of former athletes. I contacted about 15 former athletes and asked them a couple questions. And the questions were basically, what, what did strength and conditioning do for you and your program to establish a culture within your program and the university as a whole? And you know, what were some things that I taught you? Those are the two questions I asked. That every single athlete I, I had reached out to gave me about two pages worth of notes. And they, every single one of them said, hey, if you need more coach, you let me know. I got plenty more than that. I gave you the Coles notes. So our, our athletes really value our culture a lot. And here are some statements that they had about it. And I share this with you because our culture, really it's owned by the athletes. Ultimately, it's their culture, okay? We, we might guide them, we're the stewards of it. We maybe try and maintain it year to year, but the athletes, they own that culture. It's theirs, okay? So who better to ask about what our culture actually is? So first one. The culture at NDSU speaks for itself. It's a winning culture. How's that? Figured we'd start off real in depth for you, really, really deep. Um, that student athlete did graduate. He has a, he's very successful and he does have a great job, okay? We have pride wearing green and gold. We're protective of it and it means everything to us. They take a lot of pride in our colors. NDSU is a special place with a strong tradition. Choosing to be a bison was one of the best decisions I could have made. What separates NDSU from other teams in the Summit League and in the nation are the culture, the values, and the mindset. Our athletes really believe that what we do, what we do and how we do separates us. It was the culture and the responsibility that came along with being, a bison, being in the Bison program that drove me every day. It was drilled into each team at the BSA and held by all of us. After graduating, I realized that being a Bison was much more than just playing a game. And what that speaks to is the development you go through and becoming a better person having been in our program. And I think that's our goal as coaches. We want people that enter our program to come in one way and leave, not just as better athletes, but as better people by the time they're done in our program. And there are a number of athletes that really truly believe that, that from being in the, the Bison program, being in our culture, um, they benefit personally as much as anything else. So, question, what drives culture? Okay. Leadership. Leadership drives culture. Okay? What drives leadership? Culture. Culture drives leadership. Two sides of the same coin. Okay? Leadership drives culture and culture drives leadership. They both go hand in hand. Leadership drives culture in new organizations. So when you are first walking into a new job, Okay? Um, your leadership will drive the culture. Your leadership will set the groundwork, will lay the rules, and say this is the way we're going to start doing things. Okay? Also, another situation where leadership drives culture okay, is when you have a bunch of new freshman athletes coming in. 
okay? Maybe you graduated like we did a few years ago with our volleyball team. Um, we graduated a bunch of uh, uh, seniors. So we brought in eight freshmen, okay? We lost our culture. So to redevelop our culture, um, we really had to have strong leadership to make that happen. Okay? Conversely, in an established organization, one that's been around for a while, one that's been maintained and sustained and proven to be successful, um, culture will drive your leadership. Okay, so you've got a mature team, okay, mostly juniors and seniors. Uh, they'll set the freshmen right. They'll say, hey, this is how we do it here. This is how we do it in an issue. This is our way. This is what makes us successful. They'll drive, your, they'll drive uh, leadership in those situations. And once again, it's two sides of the same coin. They both go hand in hand. They interplay on each other. I think often though in our situation, leadership is really what's going to make it make you uh, successful because of all the turnover that you have. Whether it's with staff members in your strength program, you have interns, you have GAs, you have assistants, they get new jobs, you've got to have strong leadership. Also, you're continually graduating people. You're continually turning over your roster, you're continually making it better, so leadership's really important. And I'd ask you, when you're evaluating your programs, when you're evaluating yourself, uh, even when you're evaluating our profession, okay, what's the limiting factor? These are books by Malcolm Gladwell. I, I really like him as an author. Um, and the reason I like him as an author is he always gets down to what the limiting factor is. He always kind of figures out, hey, this is, this is the piece that holds it back. This is, this is the one thing that makes it happen. And I think when you're a young coach, when you're first getting into the field, when you're learning this profession, what makes it happen, what your limiting factor is, it's the technical aspect of the field, okay? It's learning the drills. Okay? It's learning the list. It's learning how to program. It's learning how to do all those things, the technical aspects of your job. Okay? Um, however, I think when you get older in the profession, when you get more established, those things, the investment in the technical aspect of the field doesn't pay off the way it used to. Okay? When I first started coaching, the more technically sound I got in lifts, in coaching, in training, in drills, I got better as a coach, and my athletes got better, and, were, and it kept paying off. So I kept doing it more and more and more. So I'd research more exercises, better ways to program, better ways to do things. Who's doing this? What's doing that? I think Adam talked, touched on that earlier. What's the drill? What's the sequence? How do we program? What's the progression? I want to learn as much as that as we could, and it made a big difference. But eventually, you get to a point of diminishing returns, and this is a cycle we catch ourselves in. We keep doing the same things over and over again, expecting them to give us the same benefit they did when we were young and didn't have as much knowledge base. Okay? And I think it's time to change. Okay? I think we've got to surrender the memories. Okay? Yesterday's formula for success is today's formula for failure. So if you want to be successful, I think if you want to move forward, okay, you've got to shift your focus. Leadership is where I think you need to shift it to. For me, in our program, okay, and I think in our profession in general, leadership is where we need to start spending most of our time. Leadership's where it starts, and leadership's where it's going to end. A lot of different models of leadership. Uh, I think there's a lot of different styles. Throughout my career, I've worked with a lot of different coaches, uh, different bosses, different ADs, and everyone's got a slightly different leadership style, and there's a lot of different ones that work. Some I like better than others. Some work better for me, and I've got my own in general. There's some different models, too. And here's one model. Okay, this is your, your basic organizational chart. Director's at top, and everyone else falls in behind. And you've got lines connecting the director to the assistants, eventually to the GAs, and eventually interns. Um, so everything kind of starts at the top and flows down. Okay, doesn't really signify anything really flowing up. Okay, doesn't really signify any growth going the other direction. Here's another model for the leadership. The director. Okay, you're at the top of the pyramid, you have your assistants, you have your graduate assistants, you have your interns. Okay, as you add staff, as you add people, you build yourself up higher and higher and higher. Look at me, I'm the director. I'm at the top. I'm the king of the mountain. Okay, that's not a great model for leadership in my opinion. That's not something that uh, really works for me. Okay, I don't think it's something that will create a successful culture. And I really don't think it's something that improves our profession or us as people long term. Okay? Flip that pyramid upside down. Okay? Directors at the bottom. Then your assistants, your GAs, your interns, your athletes. What this is saying is you're at the bottom of the pyramid. You're there to support them. You're there to hold them up. Okay? For me, I've got a variation on that. 
it's, this is my model for leadership. Okay, I know what you're thinking right now. Okay, great. I hear this guy come to talk about winning rings, getting championships, getting it done, building culture, and this guy puts up a picture of a tree. Okay, well here's the thing about the, the pyramids and organizational charts. They can grow. They can develop. They are what they are. They're set in stone. A tree, tree can grow. Tree can get stronger, tree can get bigger, tree can spread out. Okay? So I put myself, this is kind of a model for our program. For me, I put myself on the trunk of that tree. Okay? On the base, on the support. Above it, the branches. Okay? Assistants, grad assistants, interns, spreading out, leaves. You want to think maybe those are the athletes. Okay? Base of that tree, underground, those are our roots. Those are our core values. That's who we are, that's what we stand for. Okay? Soil around us, that's our knowledge. My job as a leader, okay, my job as a director of a program is to keep us, our program, our branches connected to our core values. Okay? Each part of this tree plays a part in the success of our program. Okay? There's not one part of the tree that doesn't depend on another part. There's not one part of the tree that doesn't add value to another part. So we all support each other. We all have to work together. We all have to be a part of making this thing better. And that's how I run my program. Okay? So leadership. Things, things I really believe. Number one, it's not about you. It's definitely not about power or privilege. It certainly can't be about being in charge. Okay? It's about serving others. To lead others, you've got to lead yourself before you can lead others. And to lead others, you must know yourself. Those are two things I really believe. You really got to know what you're about before you go start telling people what they need to be about. So I'm going to share with you guys my mission statement. Okay? A mission statement is something that I've been working on for the last year. And I think it's something that's really helped me out and, and and clarify my purpose, my vision, really what I want to be about as a coach. So there's a lot of things that, um, in this last year, one of the things I had a chance to do was I had a chance to hear Gus Bradley speak. He's a former NSU coach, former NSU player, currently the head coach of the Jacksonville Jaguars, and he came back to Fargo and he talked about his culture. He talked about the way he does things. He talked about that. Everything that goes into his program and his coaching philosophy. And one of the things that he said and he thought, really thought it was his cornerstone, he really thought this really got things done for me, was he developed a mission statement. And he did that, I think when he was a, a first year assistant or maybe a grad assistant at North Dakota State. And what that mission statement does, I think writing your mission statement down is a lot like writing a goal down. You can have a goal, you can have an idea, and you'll work towards it, maybe. You might start taking steps towards it, perhaps. But when you write a goal down, guess what? You do it. All of a sudden, there's accountability to it. And so that's what I did with my mission statement. I wrote it down. Put it in into words. All these things that I was thinking about what I want to be about, personally and professionally, and I put it down on paper. And all of a sudden, things changed. Gives me clarity. Gives me purpose. Make sure that I got checks and balances for who I am and what I want to be about in every single thing that I do. So here it is. With an understanding heart and a humble mindset, I will have a positive impact on the lives of others. In short, with an understanding heart. I'm going to care about other people. Without a doubt, I'm going to care about other people. I'm going to care about the people in this room, my athletes, my interns, my GAs, assistants, okay? Anyone that comes across my path, I'm going to care about them, okay? That's how I choose to go through life. Humble mindset. I'm not going to let my ego get in the way of my own success, okay? I'm going to stay humble as best I can in everything I do. I'm going to understand that I'm very fortunate and very lucky to be in my position. Okay? as every single one of you are as well. Because if I left my position, okay, within a week, there would be about 100 applicants for it. Okay? And within three months of the next person being on the job, no one would remember me, what I did, what I was about, or how the program was. Okay? Remind yourself of that daily in everything that you do. Okay? I will have a positive impact on the lives of other people. I'm here to help. I get more satisfaction out of helping people grow, develop, and improve than of anything else that I do. So I put it in there and it's really important to me. These are my core values. Okay? Um, 
These are things that are important to me. These are things I picked up as a coach. These are things that resonate through our program when I work with our athletes and when I coach with our athletes. And that's why I'm sharing this stuff with you. First one, lead by example. In everything I do, I will lead by example. And I will hold myself to that. Um, I will expect it of myself, okay, long before I expect it of anybody else. Whether it's how I coach, how I work, how I treat other people, okay, I'm going to expect that of myself first. Treat others how you want to be treated, okay? How that applies to the profession is simply this, okay? A lot of us, whether as athletes or young coaches coming up in the field, you may or may not have had a great experience with your coaches, your first bosses, your people that were involved in it. Learn from their mistakes, okay? Don't repeat someone else's mistakes in your training and how you go throughout your life. If it was a good experience, great. Repeat it. But if it wasn't a good experience, if it didn't make you better, if it didn't make you feel good, don't treat someone else that way. Do it better. Hold yourself to a higher standard. Do your best. Everything that you do. If it's worth doing, it's worth doing right. Everything I do, I'm going to ask myself, is this the right way to do it? Is this the best way? Is this the best drill? Is this the best practice? Is this the right way? Because if we're going to do it, by all means, we are going to do this thing the right way. And the last one, probably most importantly, you can accomplish anything if you put your mind to it. It's amazing, um, you know, what your parents tell you when you're three or four or five years old and you don't want to clean your room because there's too much stuff out. And they tell you, hey, dig in and go do it. And they tell you that phrase, how that sticks with you. And it resonates for me in everything I do. And I'll tell you this, for me personally, and I'm sure for many of you, if you really want something, if you really want to go after it, um, you put your mind to it, you dig in and you work day after day, week after week, you get there. And there's so many times in my life where I felt like I can't do it, this isn't going to happen. Well, if it was important to me, I did it. If it was important to me, I got it done. And that's something I think that if you're a strength coach, you really need to believe in that. You really got to believe in the work ethic that it takes to get it done. So now I start talking about our program, because that's really why you guys came here today hear about our program and hear maybe a little bit about how I apply all that stuff to what we do. Okay? So first thing, when we talk about our program, I have to talk about our athletes. Okay? They're really the foundation of what we do. Um, and our, our mission here is our program will provide every athlete with the opportunity to reach their full potential. Our kids in our program, uh, we have great kids. They're blue collar, they need to develop, they're hungry, some of them have a chip on their shoulder. Um, but most importantly, they're willing. We recruit unbelievable kids to our program. I'm, I'm very fortunate. We have kids that want to do all these things. We have kids that want to be a part of this. We have kids that understand, hey, we're going to have to go to the weight and we're going to have to work to reach our potential. Okay, so the coaches recruit that for us. The other thing they recruit, um, we recruit really smart kids. Okay, we recruit really intelligent kids. And, and uh, we had our, our Bison Gala last, this Monday. And at that, uh, basically it's our year end awards, kids get dressed up, male athlete of the year, female athlete, bison pride, freshman year, all this stuff. And one of the things they talked about was our academic success. NDSU is a top 100 university in the country, research based. Regionally, within a five state area, we are number one. We recruit really great kids, they're good athletes, but they're also very good students. We had 59 4.0 athletes last fall, 59. That tells you a lot about the kid, type of kid and the type of athlete I get to work with every day. So not only are we winning on the court, okay, or on the field, or on the track, we're winning in the classroom, which is really, that's why they come there. Our approach is simple, in my mind. Create the right environment and put people in positions to be successful. And the two go hand in hand. And kind of, you don't have to force it, it's gonna happen. These are some words that I think describe our program, okay? Um, attention to detail, mental and physical toughness, compete every day, run through the line. Leadership, expectations, accountability, discipline. Those are words that describe our, our program. Those are not my words. Okay? Those are the words from the athletes I contacted about the presentation. Those are the words, those are the things that they told me were important. Those are the things that they told me made a difference in our culture in the weight room and their, their progress and their culture within their team. It meant a lot to me as a coach to get that stuff back. 
okay? Because those are the exact things that I feel are important, okay? So I feel like we're communicating our message really well and we're getting through to them if they give that stuff back to me, okay? I got, I moved into my director position, I'm in my fifth year now, okay? So just over four years ago, um, I, I had the chance to start coming up with what my vision for the program was and I shared this with our staff. So within a week, we sat down, we had this meeting, okay, as a group, and I shared the vision. And this is what we want our program to be about. And I really think you gotta know what you wanna be about before you can start getting there, okay? So first of all, we will be respected for what we do and how we do it by the athletes and coaches that we serve. We'll have a well-trained, competent, knowledgeable, eager staff that works well together. We will be a team. We, gotta give, we have no other option. We will be a team. We will work as a team in everything we do. We'll provide all our athletes with the services they need to succeed. Okay? It doesn't matter to me what sport, how many people watch you on TV, how many people pay to come to your games. Guess what? You're one of us and we're going to take care of you when you come in there. We have a 1 to 10 coach to athlete ratio. So if you have more than 10 athletes in a group, you have two coaches. And we do that across the board. I think we are probably the only um, program in the nation this spring that had, we had six coaches with so women's soccer in the morning. We have five coaches with our track and field group in the afternoon. Because that's the level of service that those athletes need to be successful based on what our standards are. We will set a standard for others to follow. We will be known for tradition of excellence. We will be a leader. We choose to lead and we expect ourselves to be leaders in everything we do. In short, what I believe we need to do to be successful was create an environment where people want to work and athletes want to train. You work long hours, you work hard hours. Athletes grind, we grind, well guess what? Make it some place where your people and your staff want to be and make it somewhere where your athletes want to be. Because if you do that, it's not work anymore. You're enjoying it, you're having a good time. These are our core values. I think it's really important, you know, whatever game you're playing, you gotta have ground rules. You gotta know what the rules are. So we share our core values with every single person that comes into our program. We lay it out. This is the groundwork. This is how you're expected to behave. This is how you're expected to be. And you lay it out, and then you can hold people accountable to it. Um, first one, integrity. Loyal to the program and each other. We'll have trust, you'll be consistent, and we'll be honest in our evaluations and feedback of our athletes, of ourselves, uh, and our staff. Achievement, we'll be committed to success. We'll find a way to get better every day. We'll never be complacent. Uh, we're always looking for ways to improve our program. Humble, don't let your ego get in the way of your success. Be persistent, not stubborn. Hey, be persistent, not stubborn. So be willing to work at something. Be willing to work with this kid. But sometimes, you know what, you can't force it. Sometimes you gotta step back and say, hey, I'm just being stubborn. This kid, maybe he wasn't meant to be a squatter. Maybe this kid doesn't need to clean from the floor. Maybe I need to find a better way to do it, okay? I'll be persistent in helping that athlete achieve and be successful, but I'm not gonna be stubborn and say it has to be this one, one way. Next part, you're expected to have a team first mentality if you're part of our program, okay? It's always about the program. When we make decisions, they're in the best interest of our athlete and the best interest of our program and everything we do. Communicate. We will always have clear standards and expectations. We'll be able to teach a variety of learning styles. We'll share ideas and provide value to the staff and program. I have that expectation of everyone. Whether you're a field experience student who is doing 40 hours a semester, okay, or you're a full-time assistant with four years of experience, okay? Everyone is expected to add value to our program. You'll be accountable. Own your success and learn from your failures. Handle criticism in a positive manner. Focus on solutions. Ask what and how questions. QBQ, okay? QBQ, question behind the question. A uh, book by John Miller, okay? This teaches accountability. I think accountability is one of the most important things you can have in life, never mind in coaching or athletics, okay? Every member of our staff gets a copy of this book the first day they, they step in there. They get a copy of our staff manual, and the next thing they get is they get this book and they're expected to read that book. It's take, honestly, it takes about two hours to read this book, okay? I give them a week, if they're not done, we're, we're dealing with that pretty quickly, okay? 
Um, we also have a follow-up with it. So I, I talked to them about it. They, they, they have to reflect. So you can't just say you did it. I, I want to know what it was about. So this is what QBQ is about. Basically, um, in any situation, whether it goes right or wrong, you can either be accountable for it or you can be a victim. Victim thinking, if something's not going right, you ask yourself these questions. Who, where, why, when? Who is supposed to do this? Okay, where are the med balls? Why are all my med balls out of order? All right, Brad? Okay, when is that coach gonna come meet with me? Okay, things aren't going your way. That, you just took all the power away from yourself. Okay, you're a victim. You have no control of what's going on. Instead, be accountable. Ask yourself what and how questions. Okay, um, athletes aren't buying in. Um, coach is a poor communicator. Okay, what can you do to make the situation better? How can you work harder to get the coaches to buy in? Or how can you meet the coach where he's at? Okay, be accountable. When you're accountable, you've got power. When you've got, you're accountable, you're in control of that situation. Doesn't mean you can fix it right now. Doesn't mean you can fix it today. But it gives you the, the power to start thinking, start reflecting, and start coming up with the solution. Because at the end of the day, we want a solution to the problem. If you're complaining about it, if you're upset about it, you want a solution. Okay? So every member of the staff gets this book. But from this book, and, and really last fall, I, I started thinking more about our culture. And I came up with this. This is what I refer to as our formula for success. And it's simple. Five steps. Develop the standard, teach the standard, be accountable to the standard, win, and repeat. Minimum standards produce minimal results. Okay? Minimum standards produce minimal results. Well, simply, number one, figure out what you're doing. Figure out the way you want to teach it. Figure out what you want this drill to look like. Teach it. How do you teach it? How are you going to communicate it? How are you going to express what you want to happen to everyone who's in that group? And the third one, this is the hard one. This is where we fall short. Be accountable to the standard every single day. If it's the standard on the first day, then it's the standard on the last day. Whether we're having a good day, or a bad day, whether we didn't get sleep last night, whether we're tired, we're sick, run down, whatever. The standard's the standard. And if you hold people accountable to it, you get to step number four, that's winning. Okay? Winning on the court, winning on the field, winning in your weight room. Okay? You got the athlete to do it right. Okay? You got the kid to run through the line. You got them to do something they hadn't done before because you held them accountable to doing it the right way. And then repeat. Do it over and over and over again and raise the standard every single time. Okay, That's the formula for success. So that's kind of our core values of our program. So how, how do you develop a program culture? Um, I reached out to some of you about, okay, you guys want to know where to establish culture. We've been there for a while. We've been doing it. Well, how do you establish it? How do you do it? How do you make it happen? I think, I think it's in how we go about our business on a daily basis. That's what develops our culture. So, I think there's five things you have to do. And these are five things that we do every day. Number one, develop a brand. Number two, communicate. Three, train, develop, train and develop people. Train and develop your staff. Have training principles that are consistent with your core values and everything else you want to do. Things that will help you develop a culture. And five, have, develop your training environment. Develop a training environment that sets you up for what you want to achieve. So first one, develop your brand. Bison Strength and Conditioning. Really doesn't look like that. It looks really cool. I'll be honest with you. It's a great logo. We worked really hard on it. Every coach in our staff wears that logo. Every coach on our staff has that. Okay? Um, it signifies that you represent us. You represent our brand. You represent our way, our style. Okay? Um, when you are an intern, you got to get to a certain point before I give you that shirt. You got to earn it. You got to show me you meet the minimum standards. You got to show me, and more importantly, you've got to show our athletes that when you wear that, you know what's going on. Okay? Because that brand means something. I don't want to lower the standard of what that brand is or what it's about. So it's our style, our way, 
have a philosophy, communicate it to death. Basically, it's like, this is who we are, and this is what we stand for, and that's what that logo means to me, and that's what it means to our staff, and more importantly, that's what it means to our athletes. Communicate, okay? Here's the bad jokes, open door policy, okay? This is a big step for us, we moved to cubicles. Okay, we once shared an office. There were eight of us, plus interns, plus other people, and it was a triangular office. And I was at the start of the triangle, so basically I was the secretary for the office. I was so happy when we moved to cubicles. This is an unbelievable step for our program. Um, we'll get on with the presentation now. <laughs> so, talked about that first meeting I had with the staff, first meeting I had with the program. We talked about the vision. This is the next thing we talked about, okay? You will be open, you will be honest, and you will be available. That's it. Three rules about communication. You will be open, you will be honest, and you will be available. You might be busy, but if someone's coming to you with something, guess what? They need you. If, you're, if you absolutely can't drop what you're doing right now, that's fine. We'll respect that. You tell me when you've got time. You tell me, hey, I can do this. I got, this is going to take me 20 minutes, but I can talk to you then. Hey, I can call you tonight about this. Hey, let's meet tomorrow. We'll go over all this stuff. Okay? My job, I've got to be available to my staff. Okay? I've got to be there. That's my job. I've got to be there. I've got to be available. I've got to be open. I'd be willing to communicate. Okay? And maybe that means I've got to drop what I'm doing. Well, guess what? Okay? The work can wait. My people, my staff, my athletes, they can't. They're important. Okay? Is here's the thing you gotta realize. If people stop coming to you for advice, if they stop seeking your opinion or consult, it's because you're no longer leading them. Okay? If they're not coming to you, well, who are they coming to with their problems? Who are they coming to when things aren't going right? When they're having difficulties with the coach? When they don't know what's going on? It's not you, what are they doing? Are they doing it to, the, to what our standards are? Are they doing it the right way? Are they doing what best practices are in the profession? If they're a young professional? Probably not. You might be in a situation where you can figure it out on your own. I had to figure a lot of stuff out on my own. You know it would have been a lot easier? If someone showed me the way. I'm really good at learning things the hard way, okay? But it's always a lot better if I can learn from someone else's advice, okay? Train your staff. Train your staff. When you train your staff, it provides clarity, provides common ground, and it provides confidence to your staff. When your people are on the floor and they know what you're supposed to do, they know your techniques, they know your cues, they know how it's supposed to look, guess what? They're confident on the floor and they're a vocal, um, noticeable coach. Athletes know when your staff are on the same page. They know when there's a disconnect. They can sense it, they can see it. That happens when your intern is coaching someone, okay? and the athlete looks at the intern, and then they look at you. Okay, that's your first sign we're not on the same page. Athletes buy in faster when everyone gets it, and ultimately, your job is to put people and your program in a position to be successful. Okay, and this is one I hear a lot. We don't have time to train people who will only be here a few months. I don't have time to do this. Okay, what happens if they stay? What happens when they stick around? Now instead of being here for a month or two months, they decided to stick around for another semester. Now they're here for a year, okay? They've been training your athletes, or working with you, training your athletes for a year, and they may or may not know what's going on, other than what they picked up by osmosis. Now, on no means am I saying your interns are not responsible for their own development. Obviously, they've got to pay attention. They've got to know what's going on. They've got to see how you coach and learn from that. And the hands-on part of it is tremendous. But give them some, something to go with. Because here's my question for you is, what happens when one of your interns, who's been with you for a year, but maybe doesn't know the ins and outs of what you want, is in charge of an athlete, and that athlete gets hurt? How can that, how can that intern help your program get better if they don't know what the program's about? You got to train your staff. You got to develop your people. You got to develop your people to develop your program. Okay? Building a program starts with people. Okay? We hire, we got, I've got a great staff. I've got great people 
we know what we're about, we know what we stand for, we're on the same page, we work together as a team, we got great communication between each other, uh, we help each other, we push each other. One thing I will not do is, do is hire someone that will jeopardize our culture. I will not jeopardize what we have and how we're doing things. So I don't care what school you went to, I don't care who your reference is, okay? I care about your potential, I care about your values, I care about your personality, and I care about your fit. Things I care about, are you certified, okay? And the next one, do you, have a, do you have a good degree? Do you have a good GPA? Have you been a successful student? Have you worked hard? Um, do you have a good work ethic, okay? More importantly, are you a good person? Because if you have integrity, if you have all those things, I have a system in place where we can develop you. We can make you into as good a strength coach as you want to be, because it's all there. It's all set up for you to be successful, but what won't be successful is if you don't have the work ethic, you're not a good person, you don't have the integrity, it's not going to happen. I can't make that happen. But if you've got this stuff, I can make it happen. When it comes to developing people, um, and it comes to leadership, this is probably one of the best books I've read. Five Levels of Leadership by John Maxwell. Okay? And what this book does is it really lays out you know, the relationship part of leadership. And leadership ultimately, it's about relationships. It's always been about relationships. That's what it's about. And it really lays out very clearly how to advance through different levels and really criteria you need to meet and, and helps you gain understanding about maybe why that coach isn't listening to you, doesn't want to buy in, why those athletes aren't listening to you when you first get there. Okay? It's because your lead level of leadership with that person. The first level, position, it's rights. People follow you because they have to. They're listening to you because you're the boss. They're listening to you because you're in charge. And that's it. Okay? You know, how many of you have ever been in a situation where you know, someone told you, you're working with, your boss told you, it's like, hey, you need to do it this way because I'm in charge. You need to do it this way because I'm the boss. How'd that make you feel? That's a, hey, let me, let's go. It fired up about it? No, you didn't. They pulled rank on you, okay? And that's what position leadership is. It's the weakest form of leadership there is. You can be in a leadership position for 30 years and still just be a position leader just using your position, your power over other people to get what you want. What that signified is, is people generally coming in and walking out the door. Because motivated people don't want to work in that environment. Okay, next one, permission, relationships. People follow you because they want to. Okay, you get to know them. You have a conversation with them. Okay, you ask your athletes how they're doing. They start to like you, you tell a joke, you tell them a little bit about yourself. You start developing a relationship beyond just, hey, I'm your boss, or I'm your strength coach. So now they'll follow you because you're the, you're the strength coach, you're in charge, and also because they like you. Next level, production, results. People follow you because of what you've done for the organization. You're winning, you're being successful. Kids are getting stronger, kids are getting, people are getting better. And that's why they're following you now. Okay, in addition to the relationship and your title. Next one, people development, reproduction. People follow you because of what you've done for them. Okay, people follow you because of what you've done for them. You've invested in them. You've made them a better coach. With our athletes, you made them better athletes. I think this is a pretty easy one to get to with athletes. It's kind of a natural process as they go through, and maybe why some people have better, some coaches have better relationships with their athletes than they do with their staff. Their athletes see them at a higher level of leadership than their staff does. Their athletes see them at level four because they've taken them from a 98 pound weakling to a 220 pound stud. Okay, you've done something for me. You've, you've made me better. Okay, I see it, I believe it. You've developed me, I'm gonna follow you. And with their staff, they're still at level one. They're just the boss. Okay, disconnect within your staff, disconnect within your program. Last level, pinnacle. This is the one I think you all want to aspire to be. Okay, it's about respect. People follow you because of who you are, and, and what you represent. They follow you because of who you are and what, what you represent. It's what you're always about. Most interesting thing about this is you don't determine what your level of leadership is with other people. Other people determine what your level of leadership is with them. 
It's about your investment in them. It's how you work with them. It's not about what you want. You might want to be a level five leader, but everyone sees you as level one, ain't gonna happen. If you don't work on building relationships, you don't work on doing things for other people, you're never ever gonna get where you truly want to be. So you've got to create an environment where people want to work if you want to get that level five. Okay? You got to care about the people you work with, you got to build personal relationships, you got to develop your staff as professionals. Invest in the people, give them feedback, help them grow and develop. Okay? Make them better, evaluate them, coach your staff is basically what it is. I'm going to talk next about our training principles. Um, our training principles, I think, put our, our program in a position to be successful, okay? And these, this, isn't, this has nothing to do with sets and reps. This is kind of how we go about our business, okay? So, first one, believe in your own message. If you're going to put an exercise in there, if you're going to stand in front of a group, you better believe in what you're doing. You got to own the information and you got to do your homework. Before I put something in, okay, an exercise or a drill or a concept or a conditioning, our staff has gone through that numerous times. Numerous times before I put our athletes through it. Last summer, we decided we want to start doing some Tabata conditioning okay, with our athletes. Our staff went through that stuff for a month. Okay, two, three, four days a week conditioning ourselves with it to figure out what was going to work, what were the ups and downs, what were the pitfalls before we ever put it in. And we stood in front of those groups and we said, athletes, this is what you're going to do. They believed it, they bought into it, and they knew it was the right thing to do because we were so confident in delivering that message. Development is a process. You cannot skip steps. You have to use progressions. Yesterday afternoon, uh, we had a class uh, from another university come by and stop in and talk to us. And one of the athletes asked me, or one of the uh, students asked me, you know, what's, what's one of the biggest mistakes you ever made you know, as a strength coach? And I said, well, it's kind of hard to, to narrow it down to just one. But I'd say the one is not using progressions. Okay? When I first started, it was you're going to clean, you're going to squat, you're going to bench. Sure, these, there's these other exercises. That's all fine and well. You just do them if you want to. We're going to stick with those three and we're going to go. Well, and I've since learned that no, it's probably better to have a progression. It's probably better to figure out um, how you want an athlete to get from point A to point B versus just jumping them into point B because that's the end game. That's where you want to get to. That's fine, but we'll use progressions. And I think it allows your athletes to buy in, allows them to trust you because they're having success when they work with you. If you put them too far ahead, you put them too far advanced, okay, and they're not ready for it, they're going to be in a position where they're going to be fighting you, they're going to be trusting you. Especially if you've got, if it's a freshman athlete and you strictly have position leadership with them. They don't know you, they don't know what you're about, they don't know what you stand for. They're not going to trust you enough that that's the right thing to do. So use progressions to help you build that trust with them. Do simple things exceptionally well. If you can't coach to a standard, don't use it. It might be the best drill when you're one-on-one. -on -one. It might be the best thing to do when you got a group of three. But if you've got a group of 30, okay, or 40 athletes, and you're by yourself, um, and it, it can't be done right, don't do it. Okay, they're not eventually going to figure it out. They're just never ever going to do it right. Okay? <laughs> um, don't specialize in being complex with anything. I, I've, I've made this mistake, and I'm sure many of you have too in your careers. You, you want to add more, you want to do more, you want to do more. And I get to this point where I'm sitting there and I'm like, this is just too much. And I peel it back. And you know what starts happening? It gets easier. It gets more fun. It gets more enjoyable for me and for the athletes. So make it as simple as you possibly can, but do it really, really well. Keep the quality high and the complexity low. Make it about the team. Okay? If you train people as individuals, don't be surprised when they play that way. Okay? 90% um, rule. If 90% of your team can't do the exercise or that variation of the exercise, find something else to do. Being a team means we go through it together. Whether it's good, whether it's bad, whether it's easy, whether we're suffering, follow the 90% rule. Because regardless, when you go out through, throughout that training block, 10% of that 
or more is still going to have some type of modification. They're still going to have some type of deviation from what you want to do. Okay? Always make it about the team. Uh, I, I know in the past I've had programs where these more advanced athletes were doing it this way and these other athletes were doing it this way. It doesn't work. We are so disconnected and unaware of what everyone else around us was doing that you, you don't know if someone's being successful. You don't care what your teammates are doing. You're going through your own thing. Make it about the team. Last one, I got this from our men's basketball coach who's a very close friend of mine. Don't get bored of being great. Don't change for the sake of change. Evolve, question what you're doing, make your process better, refine your process, but don't just change just to change. Don't get bored of being successful. Okay? Don't, bore, don't be bored of doing it. I mean, I know it can be monotonous, but if it's working and it's producing results, refine it, tweak it, find maybe a, a way to adjust it. But don't get bored of it and change it just to say you changed it. Okay? Um, and that, that doesn't mean that we don't evolve. That doesn't mean that we don't change. Okay? Our programs are different than they were three, four, or five years ago. The nuts and bolts are the same. The exercises are very similar. Maybe how we set it up, maybe how we lay it out based on our feedback, that's evolved. But what we're doing hasn't really changed. Next part I think makes it successful is our training environment. That's our weight room. Um, there is nothing in there, in my opinion, that we don't have that we need. We've got 20 racks and platforms, we've got another six half racks, we've got 40 yards of turf, we've got dumbbells, we've got med balls, we've got fizz balls, we got equipment in a storage room, I don't even know what we have in there. We've got a lot, okay? And it's all in a grocery store, okay? Um, in our training, in our room, when you walk in the door, I think this is kind of the biggest thing that you're going to notice. If you watch this coach, if you watch this workout, is really it's how we coach, how we go about our business on a daily basis, how we give feedback. I would hope if you came into the room, you would see that everything was being coached to the standard. And if an athlete wasn't there, they were being coached to get better. And we were working with them. They weren't just let to do it wrong. We'll be specific with our instructions. Okay? I uh, read a book. Um, two years ago, it's called Practice Perfect. I think it's by Doug Lamov. And he's the guy they wrote, Teach Like a Champion. Okay? And in this book, they talk about the teaching techniques they use uh, to communicate in charter schools. And what are things that make these people successful, elite level teachers? This is an unbelievable book for me. And it goes through simple things you practice within your lessons and simple things you need to do uh, to get people on the same page. This book was unbelievably valuable to me when I had eight freshman athletes coming in on one team and two returning, and one returning senior really, or one returning athlete who was a sophomore and two more that were first year transfers that had been with me for a few months, okay? Unbelievably good for me in terms of giving them Specific, being specific with instructions, pointing them on the right path, teaching them what to focus on that day. Um, specific instruction example for you would be, I, I always tell our staff, never tell an athlete, hey, good job. Because really, if I'm an athlete, you tell me good, or you tell me, hey, that was bad, okay, what was bad? What was bad, what was good? Be specific. That was a great job keeping your back flat. Okay, that was a great job keeping your back flat. Okay, and you can talk. That sets you up for a great pull. Okay, hey, your knees were out on that squat. That's exactly how it needs to be. That's how it's got to feel. Do you feel that? Do you feel how smooth your, your cleans were when you, when you brought your knees back off the floor? That's how it's got to be. Be specific so you can communicate and feel, uh, communicate and if, they hit the, if they hit the target, if they hit the standard. Okay, let them, um, most importantly, let them know when they're doing something good, especially with your young athletes. They're going to have your first probably month, two months, you're going to have a lot more failures in a weight room than you're going to have success. You're going to have a lot more failures than you're going to have success. But when they do something right, recognize it. Acknowledge their effort, acknowledge their improvement. Okay? I, I think uh, this is something we try and do really, really well. 
and with our athletes, just, you know, some kids are going to pick it up faster than others. Doesn't mean the kid that got it easier is working harder than the kid that's not getting it yet. Might have some mobility. If you're working on a squat, maybe he's got some ankles that aren't good. Maybe he's got some hips that need to be worked with. That's fine. When he gets the standard, acknowledge it. Let them know how hard you saw them working. Let them know the investment that you put into it. Okay? Let them know that you see them getting after it. That you see the progress that they're making. And we had an athlete with us, and she was the only athlete in that group of eight freshmen. And it took her 18 months to get to back squat. Most of her teammates were back squatting um, within six weeks, right on our progression. It took her 18 months between back position, flexibility, everything else before we felt comfortable moving her to that next step up. Okay? But when she got there, but when she got there, we let everybody know. Okay? We tweeted it out. We celebrated it in the weight room. Okay? We talked about it for weeks. Okay? And that was important to that athlete. And I know it was important because the anniversary of it, the day that it happened, okay, she had it come up on her Facebook feed and she reminded me of how important that was to her. That we acknowledged that she had worked for it and she'd earned the right to graduate. Had another athlete, one of our male athletes with push-ups. We were doing a, when he was a freshman, we do kind of a, and he's red shirting for our men's basketball program, we do a push-up circuit at the end of our lift. And on his, when he was a freshman, Man, I didn't know, I didn't know if he's going to make it with his upper body. He was a disaster. He got, by his last set, if he could do four push-ups on a set of ten, it was an unbelievable day. We, we, we were successful. Okay? Well, this spring, after having been in our program okay, for three years, on his last set, he knocked out 24. He improved by 20. Okay? While gaining more weight, while getting stronger. And he just quietly went about doing it. And I saw it, but his teammates didn't all see it. So when we brought it up at the end, okay, we acknowledged it. And the reason we acknowledge it, number one is, hey, I see you working. I see how much you're getting better. I want you to know that, okay? But more importantly, for those younger guys that only see him as a junior or a senior who's developed, who's capable, who's only having success in the weight room and on the court, guess what? He's where you were a few years ago. This is what happens when you work hard. This is what happens when you follow the plan. This is what happens when you do it our way. You have this success. So we celebrate it. You acknowledge it. You let them all know, hey, he's doing a great job. Okay? These next words, all this stuff here, this is in the words of our athletes. These are the things that they told me were important within our training program. The feedback, that's the one thing I think is really, really important in how we coach. This is the stuff that they told me and these are some quotes that go along with it. First one, attention to detail. Do it right every time and make it a habit. That attention to detail translates into everything we did on the court. Hard work. We work hard, you work hard. Okay? Workouts were challenging but achievable. We learned to rise to the challenge. You taught us what hard work really is as soon as we stepped on campus. We value hard work in our program. It will be accountable to the standard. Okay? When I say he held us to a certain standard, I mean he gave no slack when it came to execution and performance. It did not matter what your name was or where you came from, the expectations were all the same, always the same. Okay? I don't care who you are or where you came from or how good you are, you're going to do it to the standard that we set. Bar none, there's no deviation from it. Okay? and everyone is treated the same. Okay? When I was an athlete, the only thing, I'd, I didn't mind being held accountable. I didn't mind being told I could do it better. I didn't mind being challenged. I minded it. What I didn't like was when this guy didn't have to do it to the level I did. When that guy could get away with it. So when I'm a coach, it ain't going to be that way. We're all going to be the same. Doesn't matter who you are, what your playing time is, how important you are, it's going to be the same across the board. And I work very hard to make it that way every day. Effort and focus are expected. Effort and focus are expected. It was the expectations that you had for us, that we learned to have for ourselves, that set the tone for what our culture was. It was looking out for your partner, for your group, for your team. 
pushing them until they couldn't do it anymore, but at the same time doing it at their best. Okay? That effort, that focus, it added, it builds to our culture. Compete. Okay? Our athletes are challenged daily in the weight room. Okay? Do their best and find a way, way, to get, way to win and get better in everything. We talk about this. Find a way to get better today. Find a way to improve yourself. Find a way to improve at something. And the ways we challenge them. Hey, did your technique get better? Yeah, it did. You got better today. Okay? Did you lift more weight? Um, we're at the point where we do, we'll do open sets. So our last set of an exercise is going to be open. We might have pr programmed weights for the first three sets. Last set's open. Well, we have kids now to the point where if they feel like they, they couldn't take it up, whether it's even five pounds, they feel guilty. They feel like they let their team down because they didn't push themselves, they didn't challenge themselves enough. More reps. We'll rep out sets. And this is, this is unbelievable. We did this, started doing this last fall. And we're having athletes that are doing reps that if you look in a textbook, they physiologically, they can't do. Okay, so we might rep out a set of front squats. And at whatever percentage we're at, the top you should be able to do is gonna be 15. Okay, so I arbitrarily said 20 reps. Let's see what happens. Well, every kid on that team did 20. Every single kid hit the standard because they didn't want to be the guy that didn't do it. They didn't want to be the guy that couldn't meet, meet the expectations. And the next thing, better finish. Did you finish the workout better? Were you still tired? Were you fatigued? Did you handle it better? When you started getting, when you started getting run down, did you shut down or did you keep pushing yourself through it? Okay, we win at all these things. And from our athletes, we wanted to win in everything we did, whether it was one rep, one second, or one pound. Yesterday I had uh, two of our men's basketball athletes doing front squats, and they had a chance to take it up every single set. And they're basically at the same max. I think they're within five pounds of each other, but their weights are the same. And on this last set, the first athlete did 205. And so the second athlete gets in there. And I say, okay, what are you gonna do? 205. Well, it was a significant increase, so I asked him, okay, so we're going for the tie today? That's what, that's what we're gonna do now? That's great, we, we want a tie for championships? I thought we wanted to win here, and I walked away. Well, 2010 was on the bar, as soon as I walked away, and he did it. Okay, we challenged them to compete, they wanna do it. We'll do lap pull downs, and kids will go find magnet weights and put a one and a quarter weight on there just to say they did the most. Okay, they will compete, they will win. You made it fun for me to come work out every day because I knew we were going to compete. So one word that sticks out in there is fun. That does not necessarily mean this. Okay, the weight room's not super fun time. It's not, it's not gumdrops and lollipops. Okay, it's not, it's not, uh, it's not recess. Okay, but we want to work hard. We want to have fun. We want to have fun working hard. I want kids that want to train hard. I want them to want to enjoy it. This cannot be a joyless experience. I've talked to people um, who are former athletes, okay, at other schools, other universities, and they told me they hated working out. They hated going to the weight room. It was miserable. I don't want that to be their experience with me. I don't want that to be their experience at NDSU. I don't want that to be their experience in our program. So we'll find ways to incorporate some fun into our program. We'll find some ways to incorporate some apple pie, okay? Not literally, okay? So this is related to me um, by Chris Carlisle uh, when he was at USC. When I was first, uh, I, my first job was at Long Beach State in California, and I had a chance to hear him talk at a conference at, at uh, College of the Canyons, the junior college in, in uh, Southern California. And one of the things he talked about was, within his workouts, he wanted to make sure there was some apple pie. Okay? And the story goes, basically, is like this. It really doesn't matter what your mom cooked for dinner. It doesn't matter how overcooked the meat was. It didn't matter how much you didn't like the vegetables, or if the potatoes weren't the style you liked. Okay? At the end of that meal, you got some apple pie with some ice cream on it. Guess what? That was a great meal. It was fantastic. That meat was great. The vegetables were just what I wanted because you got apple pie. You got what you wanted, okay? And 
that was kind of changed, changed some stuff up for me once I heard that story because I was really taking myself a little too seriously in my first year at Long Beach. I was trying to build a program. I was trying to establish a culture. We had people that they'd, they'd, rather, they'd rather just do arms than actually lift weights. So we didn't do it. Okay? Even though I liked to do it, I stopped doing it. And then I realized, wait a minute, I really like doing the arms. That's, that's part of the reason I train. And I said, there's probably a really good chance that my kids would like that too. And, and we started this at Long Beach State and uh, it was Bicep Friday. And it's since evolved and it's grown and it's really become its own thing. Um, and basically what it involves is kids are, I'm going to get out of them what I want out of them. I mean, they're going to work hard. They're going to get after it. And they're going to get out of it with they want out of it. Their arms are going to be pumped up. They're going to be feeling jacked. They're going to be feeling really, really good about what they did and how they did it. And it's probably they're working at such a pace, there's conditioning involved with it too, and they have no idea. They just, they know it's hard, and they like it, okay? Um, so what we'll do is at some point in their training uh, on Friday, they don't know when it's gonna happen. Um, they haven't figured out when it's gonna happen yet. It's usually the last Friday of a training block. Uh, we hide this somewhere. It's shaped exact size of a plate. And credit to Coach Lopez for designing this. Uh, your legacy lives on, okay? Um, so we have this and we hide it somewhere in the weight room, we hide it within our weight trees. So they don't know it's coming and, and usually uh, it's gonna involve them needing to condition, get on the line, uh, someone did something wrong, they've gotta confess to it, whatever, and we pull this out, they see it, they spin the wheel, they're jacked. I think the last three times it's been the same one and we changed the circuit, they've got no idea. Um, but we have a good time with it. So we kinda have this. Uh, we we kinda have a, a meathead culture. That's, that's what we've gotten to the point to, and I feel really good about it. So we'll, we'll have pose downs at the end of Friday lifts. Guys will be battling each other for who can have the best cutoff. Um, we, have, uh, we don't have mirrors in our weight room anymore, so we'll bring out the iPad so they can see themselves curling. And, uh, and we actually FaceTime them so they could see it from the side while looking straight ahead. It's a, kind of an original, original piece there. We have a meathead culture. Okay, well, what's wrong with having a meathead culture? Here's the thing. Do you know any guy or girl who's an absolute meathead and doesn't like lifting weights? I don't. As a matter of fact, when I was growing up, when I first started going in the weight room, when I first started training, the guys who were the meatheads, they had the best technique. They were the most consistent, they worked the hardest, and they did it every single day. Okay? So we're going to have a little bit of a meathead culture. We're going to talk about guys crushing weights. We're going to tell them if it didn't go up, you had just had a gravity storm. We're going to ask them, did you turn off gravity today? You're getting after it. Okay? We're going to tell them you look jacked. You're pumped up. And the kids will get out from their weight and they'll say, Coach, I'm iron deficient. I need more. They'll tell me, I got, feed me, Coach. I need to eat. And it's awesome. And it's a lot of fun. We're working hard. We're having fun with it. Okay? This is something else we came up with. It was a conditioning challenge. It's Mount Crushmore. Okay? It's four conditioning trials. You can only do it at the end of your workout. We did this with our volleyball this season. Okay? You gotta, it's one trial on the Versa Climber, it's lactate trail. Okay? Then the next one is 60 second sprint on the Versa Climber, it's gone in 60 seconds. From there, it's a 30 on, 30 off, seven times, fast and furious. They make an eighth movie, it's gonna go up to eight. So you gotta, they gotta get it done soon. And the last one, Stairway to Heaven. It's a thousand feet in Tabatas on the Versa Climber. You gotta meet the standard to get to the next one. Um, these girls this spring, they're doing an off-season competition. If they did this, they got culture points. Because they're willing to go above and beyond. They're willing to do a little bit more. They're willing to put themselves out there when they're fatigued, when they're tired, and push themselves to another level. Things that were very consistent with who we are and what we want to be about in our program. And they got after it. And when you get this done, when you passed all these trials, and we got a couple that are, that are still working on it, um, you get to be a citizen of Crusha. Okay? This is the front page of your citizenship card. Okay? I will be forever indebted uh, to our intern for coming up with this. He worked on this for about a week at least. And on the back, get your name, your picture, we'll get your stats on there, and you've got the crushing oath. Okay? I will never bore of greatness. I will maintain high standards and exceed expectations. I will be a life preserver to those drowning in a sea of mediocrity. I hereby swear to protect Crusha against those who conspire to disperse the plague, our participation trophies, and all other acts of softness. Okay? So that's, that's what we want to be about. 
Okay? I think that's pretty cool. When we told the athletes what it was about, we had, they were all lined up, they wanted to get on a bike. Pretty cool. So and that kind of takes us to this next part, athlete buy-in. And this is, the, this is kind of the, the wrap up of this presentation. Um, so athlete buy-in, when I reached out, we talked to, to some of you, talked about how do you get people to buy-in? How do you get people to do it? Why do they want to work for you? How do you gain that trust? And this is, I, I'll, I'll touch on how I think we do it. So first, with athlete buy-in, create a place they want to train. Make your room someplace they want to be. Because if they don't want to be there, if you're miserable, okay, if you're angry all the time, if you don't like your job, ain't gonna, they're not going to want to train for you. They're not going to want to work for you. Certainly not in the long term. Next one, be consistent. Treat your athletes with respect. Okay, Treat them with respect. Make them feel comfortable. Make them feel safe. The first time I ever walked into a weight room, okay, it was the most frightening place in the world. It was intimidating, it was scary. There's a bunch of jack dudes walking around, okay? And uh, th over time, I went in there and I worked out. And I'd stay a little bit longer the next time, and a little bit longer the next time, okay? And then eventually I earned their respect. And they start talking to you. And they'll invest more time in you, okay? They made me feel comfortable, they made me feel safe. They made that weight room a place that I wanted to be. And that changed me forever, okay? Obviously got me to this point here. That's what I want to create for athletes, okay? I want to create a place where they feel comfortable and they feel safe, especially when you're a freshman incoming athlete, okay? Who's intimidated by the weight room and who's intimidated by me. I've got to find a way to get past that so I can get you to buy in. I've got to earn your trust. Other thing, help them find success, okay? When someone, you know, you're dealing with athletes, but a lot of times they've only been successful in their lives. Whatever they've done, they've been successful in their sport. Some of them are great students, they're great people. Whatever. They've only known success. And if they've never lifted weights before, the first time they come in there, they only know failure. So I help them find success. Use progressions. Work with them. Teach them. Train them. They need something more, do more for them. Help them find that success, okay? Because when someone is challenged, and they've got to work for it, and they can't figure it out on their own, and you help them find that success, you got them. They're yours. They trust you, they buy in it, and they believe. Because you developed them. Because you invested in them. Because you made them better. So help them find success, point it out in everything you do. And the last one, believe in them. I always felt that I believed in my athletes. I always felt like that's a pretty foundational thing. I always feel like I give people the benefit of the doubt. But I didn't understand how important this was until I did this presentation, I reached out to our former athletes. And through their communication back to me, I realized how important it was to believe in them. And here's some of the things that they told me. Believe in them. You instill the confidence in us that if we play to our ability, we could compete with anyone. Believe in them. You had the expectation for us to win even before we started to win on the field. Okay, that was an athlete who their first two years, I think they won like 12 games. And by their last year, they were the winningest team in that sports history. By a lot, by like 10 games. We believed that they could win long before they ever started to win. And we talked about winning on the first day, we talked about winning on the last day. Whatever the record was, we talked about how we're gonna win that weekend, how we're gonna give our best effort. And we just believed it was gonna happen. And you believe in it long enough, you work in it long enough, lo and behold, it did happen. The strength program instilled so much pride and belief in us that if we lost, we felt like it was a letdown to you guys. They felt like they let us down if they lost. They didn't let us down, but that's how they felt. That's how bad they wanted to win. They wanted to win for us and how much we did for them. I was willing to do whatever you said for me to do because I knew without a doubt that if I did what you were asking of me, I was going to be good. And probably the most profound one here at the end of the day, I bought into you because you bought into me. I believed in you because you believed in me. I buy in because you bought in. Simple. Meet them where they're at. Okay? So, brings us back to this formula for success. Okay? After going through this, you know, the past few months, 
I had a chance to reflect. I felt really, really good about this last fall. I felt like I had it. I narrowed it down. It's simple, it's concise, and really speaks to who we are and what we want to be about. Well, after going through all this, I changed it. Because I can do that. So now we have Formula for Success 2.0. Okay? And we added in step four. And I think after all this stuff, I think step four is the most important one. And step four is this. Step four is believe. Okay? Believe. Believe. Believe in who you are. Believe in why you do it. Believe in what you're doing. Believe in the way that you do it. And most importantly, okay, believe in people and their potential. Believe in people and their potential. Okay. Building a culture, okay, having a strong program, it's about people. Okay? It's about your relationships and it's about people if you want to have a culture. And at the end of the day, if you take one thing away from what I had to say, okay, it's this. Culture wins. Culture always wins. Thank you.